Kuzuzampo, welcome to Bhutan This Week, our weekly news magazine program. I'm Poop Gam. Our top stories this week. His Majesty the King grants Tha to two new secretaries. Report finds teachers in the country still quitting their jobs. And High Court sentenced Kandu Wangmo to 21 years in prison for three counts of sedition. His Majesty the King granted Tha to appoint two new government secretaries. Pema Chodin is the new Foreign Secretary. She was serving as the Director General of the Multilateral Affairs Department with the Ministry. She also served as the Ambassador at the Royal Bhutanese Embassy in Bangladesh and later as Ambassador at the Embassy in Brussels. Rinchuwandi has been appointed as the new GNHC Secretary. He was serving as a Director at the GNHC. Before that, he was the Chief Program Coordinator under the same office. Coinciding with the birth anniversary of His Majesty the Fourth Dugalpo, a seven-foot-wide jade Buddha statue was consecrated at the Salomafe Training and Resource Center for Nuns in Thimpo. His Majesty the King and Her Majesty the Gelsen graced the ceremony, accompanied by Her Majesty the Queen Mother Tsring Yang Denwonchuk, the royal patron for the center. His Holiness the Jake Himpo presided over the consecration ceremony. The Lumbini Garden Foundation, an institution that promotes Buddhist values based in Spain, offered the statue to Bhutan Nuns Foundation. The statue was carved in Myanmar. Snumpem for BBS News. A recent review of Bhutan's planning system has found it is feasible to shorten the planning cycle from five years to three years. A group of civil servants based at the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies conducted the research. They referred to the budgetary expenditures, election cycle and development partners' coordination for the study. One of the papers in the review studied the Finance Ministry's budget and expenditure data of all the projects implemented in the 11th and the 12th five-year plan. It concluded that the average duration of implementing the plans is two and a half years. It means the majority of the projects during the five-year plans were completed in the first three years. For instance, in the 11th plan, more than 75% of the projects were completed during the period. Since 77.4 percentage of project, which is a huge chunk of project, concentrate under three-year implementation period, there is possibility of having seamless alignment between uh, project cycles and three-year planning cycle. However, as per the findings, only those projects worth about 51 million item would be complete within three years. Besides. There will be projects such as zone constructions that will take several years to complete and spill over from one plan to another. There is also existing trend of projects being formulated in the middle of a five-year plan. And these projects have varying duration of cycle. So uh, if these projects are brought to align with a plan cycle, whether it's three-year or five-year plan cycle, spillover effect could be uh, reduced. The three-year planning system will also provide flexibility for the government of the day to quickly integrate its development manifesto into annual plans and budgets. The report stated that a three-year planning cycle will require rigorous planning and efficient manpower. It means strengthening the policy and planning division of the GNHC and across agencies, including the local governments. Similarly, the research on the election cycle alongside the planning cycle till the year 2050 highlighted that a three-year cycle is feasible. It aligns well with the election cycle and it will not be moved forward to align with the election cycle. In the current situation, in the five-year plan cycle, every after five years, the five-year plan will have to be moved forward by three months, 90 days in exact terms, because of the vacuum created during the interim government. This study forecasts that if the three-year plan cycle is adopted, two incoming governments will have to implement the spillover activities of the previous plan for more than a year. In 2034, the incoming new government 
will have to implement the spillover activities of the previous plan for 18 months and for 27 months in 2039. However, the spillover activities also occurs in five-year plan. As part of the review, a separate study was also conducted to understand the relationship between the development partners and the five-year plan. For instance, even if we change our plan duration to three years, there won't be a misalignment between the planning duration of development partners and the duration of our uh, development plan. As long as uh, there's a shared objective, shared development objectives between the donor and the recipient country, the donor, uh, the development partners will align their uh, plan with the country's existing uh, plan duration. A five-year plan has been guiding Bhutan's developmental processes since 1961. As per the report, a new form of governance cycle since 2008 and the ever-changing needs of the economy and citizens have led to rethink the relevance of the planning system and explore a more effective alternative. Meanwhile, it was learned that the GNH Commission is revisiting the planning system of the five-year plans. Sonam Wongdi for BBS News. People should expect another heated debate on the mines and minerals spill in the parliament next year. The Prime Minister said he will table the bill again in the summer session of the parliament since the deferred bill cannot be discussed in the same year. The Prime Minister said that it is his moral responsibility to bring back the bill to the parliament. The Prime Minister said that the whole debate around the bill is now perceived as the government not supporting the state ownership of mines and minerals. He said the government will take this remaining time to discuss properly the provisions of the mines and minerals bill. The opposition leader said he is doubtful that there would be any change. The government has to really you know, bring everybody on board to discuss about it. You know, try to bring everybody, maybe even other stakeholders like DHI, uh, and uh, because DHI is a key stakeholder as well here. So um, it will have to depend on two things, seriousness of the government in bringing everybody on board and discussing the issues thoroughly, first of all. S second, it will depend on their sincerity meaning that how much they will be able to keep national interests above party interests. The chairperson of the National Council, on the other hand, said that the House might probably not have an opportunity to discuss the bill even if it is tabled again due to the procedure of passing a bill. As per the chairperson, the two houses agreed that the strategic mines be managed by the state and leave non-strategic mines to the private sector. He said the issue was the difference between the definition of strategic and non-strategic mines between the two houses. The chairperson said the strategic mines are all minerals found in the country with high value such as dolomite, graphite and coal among others. He said the Assembly's definition is, however, questionable. Samton Dolker, BBS News. Despite being the highest paid group of civil servants in the country, several teachers in the country are still quitting their jobs. As per this year's annual education statistics, more than 350 teachers left the profession this year, which is almost double than that of last year. According to the report, most of them resigned voluntarily. Of more than 350 teachers who left their jobs, about 220 resigned voluntarily, 54 superannuated, while 3 had their employments terminated, and 49 left after their contracts expired. This resulted in an increase in the attrition rate to 3.4%. While the report does not specify the reasons, a few teachers requesting anonymity said there are many factors that contribute to teachers leaving the profession. The one reason could be uh, the workload of teachers. And the second reason could be uh, there is less facilities in the schools. Even to get a chart paper, we have so many formalities. So that's why we see a lot of teachers resigning. Another reason could be leadership. We are pressurized by our leaders. Even if the leader is not supportive, if he is not far-sighted, then teachers get frustrated with the leaders. Teachers are placed 
in the school on the wheels and beams of the authority without considering their families. For instance, wife working in the East while husband has to work in the West. Such situation gradually forced teachers to leave profession by no choice. Secondly, in many cases, teachers have to teach subject other than the specialist one and also irrelevant class level against their qualification. Meanwhile, the Education Minister J.B. Rai over a telephone interview said, while the trend is concerning, the ministry cannot stop those leaving for better opportunities. He said the trend is likely to continue for the next five years or more because of better opportunities abroad. However, the ministry will continue with their efforts to improve working conditions, provide quality professional development and streamline workload, among others, to retain teachers. Over the last six years, nearly 2,000 teachers resigned from their profession. As per the report, there are more than 10,000 teachers in the country today. Sunam Pem for BBS News. It came as a big blow for the drying owners when the government allowed all entertainment centers in low-risk areas except dryings to reopen last month. The Prime Minister's office was supposed to issue a separate notification for dryings, but they say it never came. Due to the pandemic, drawings have remained closed for almost two years now. The owners requested the Prime Minister several times to reopen. However, even today, they are still waiting for a clear written directive from the government. <laughs> เอ็นโรยาเลเซเกจักเกสิดิซุยตะตุซุนเซกะนิซินิเมนโดซุชุนินลาเตงาจิเรกะเตลุกซุเบระตาชุงลุชุยลาตาอิกโทโลเบเบ
The investigation team also found a vehicle dealer involved in evasion of green tax while bringing in dumper trucks. The commission is further investigating the cases in Pinseling. Meanwhile, the ACC did not find any corruption in the management and allocation of quarantine facilities in Pinseling. The commission had carried out a separate investigation after it received complaints of bribery against quarantine facility service providers and officials allocating the services. For Sonam Penjo in Pinsling, Isha Gelson, BBS News. The High Court sentenced Kanduangmo from Thimpu to 21 years in prison. The court gave her a prison term of seven years each for three counts of sedition. Earlier in September, the Thimpu District Court had sentenced her to a prison term of five years, but the Office of the Attorney General appealed to the higher High Court asking for a higher sentencing. The District Court convicted her of writing three seditious documents. As per the District Court's judgment, she asked a few individuals to distribute the seditious documents with the intent to ruin the lives of her ex-husband and his family members. According to the Penal Court, a defendant shall be guilty of the offence of sedition if the defendant issues an insulting and hateful statement against the king or the government with the intent to defame, disrupt, encourage contempt or incite hatred of the people. It is a felony of the third degree with a prison term of five to nine years. Meanwhile, the High Court is yet to pass its judgment on the conspiracy case which also involves Kanduangmo. In July, the Thimpo District Court had sentenced all four defendants involved in the case, but three of them appealed to the High Court. Sringzam, BBS News. The Tourism Council says no to a complete sustainable development fee or STF waiver for tourists. Instead, tourists visiting Bhutan will not have to pay the sustainable development fee while in quarantine. According to the Tourism Council, the decision is based on the advice of the Office of the Attorney General, who, upon the Council's request, interpreted the Tourism Levy Act of Bhutan 2020. The Council's Director General Doji Dardul said, someone who is in quarantine cannot be considered a tourist. In September, the Tourism Association proposed the government waive the fee as a post-COVID recovery measure. According to the association, the move will attract more tourists when Bhutan reopens for business. Today, regional tourists pay STF of 1,200 ngatam per day and international tourists pay $65. Such proposals requiring tweak in a policy is short-sighted and can also bring irreversible damage to our tourism brand, the brand Bhutan, symbolizing exclusive destination with exclusive experience for our visitors and the time-tested tourism policy and practice of high value, low volume. Any dent on this brand would be very difficult to correct as it took us 50 long years to build it. And besides, there is no guarantee that arrivals will increase even if this process is implemented According to the Director General, a similar proposal was implemented in the past, which did not have any significant impact. Based on our past experiences on a similar cases, SDF waiver for Eastern Zonkhaks was implemented for a planned period with, with the objective to attract more tourists to the East. But we know there was no significant impact. Similarly, we have been implementing lower MDPR rate for off-season to attract more tourists during off-season. Again, in this case also, we have not seen any significant impact. He suggested that the tourism sector pursue other measures such as aggressive marketing and promotion and new tourism products to bring in more tourists. Pukiem for BBS News. The Galifu Domestic Airport might become an international airport, but not anytime soon. The Department of Air Transport plans to construct an alternate runway for the Poro International Airport in times of disasters and emergencies for now. The department is still working on a master plan for the airport. Although the Galifu Airport remains the best option for international airport, the department says upgrading it to one has not been a priority. If you develop now, it will be a wastage because power itself, we have not reached capacity. At the current, uh, before pre-COVID-19, we were using capacity of 30% we were using of power airport. 
So, but at the same time, uh, we need to have a master plan. So just now we are just working on the master plan for Galifu. That's all. We do not have to plans to construct immediately because uh, we don't have the budget. He says the existing runway at the Galifu Domestic Airport is in no capacity to land an Airbus. So the department plans to construct a new runway that will be used to facilitate air services during a disaster. The runway will be around two kilometers. We need to have an alternate runway, not an airport, but a runway. So whereby in case if there is disaster and Paro runway gets damaged, we do not have any other alternate runway where you know the aids and all can come in. So therefore, we are just uh, on the planning stage just, now, just to have one runway and where uh, big, large, wide-bodied aircrafts can land. Gelifu Domestic Airport, located along Gelifu Sarpang Highway, covers about 750 acres of land. The Sarpang Zongkak recently provided a land replacement for more than 200 landowners in Samtiling Gyok. Some 30 landowners are yet to get the land replacement. Gelifu Domestic Airport started its flight service in 2012. However, due to COVID-19, the airport has been closed for over a year now. Sangeeta Zom for BBS News. That's all we have for you for this week. Thank you for joining us.